I'm usually at these really self-righteous events and I was at this particularly self-righteous environmental event where everybody was like, the reason that I'm environmental is because I just love the polar bears or blah and blah and blah. And so I'm like, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get up on stage and I'm gonna speak my truth. So I got up on stage and I said, we've heard some amazing stories about origins with environmentalism, but I want to share a story that I think actually more people in the world can relate with, at least in the feeling of it. And this is my story. When I was younger, about 22 years old, I met a really hot British girl who had a really, really hot British accent, and she was environmental, and I wanted to be too, and that is it. <laughs> right? So she's sitting in my house, um, drinking a Diet Coke, because I'm balling at the time, right? And um, she says to me something no one has ever said in my entire apartment, which is, hey, Troy, where's the recycling? So I didn't have her recycling, but I did have a box of notes, because I was a PhD student. So I went into my own trash, pulled out some Diet Cokes, put them in this trash It was just my notes, walked over to her with a cardboard box and said, I actually don't have a recycling bin because as you know, you're supposed to reuse before you recycle. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of the things I'm gonna say aren't gonna make me look like a good person. Um, I'm gonna continue on that. I just wanna lean into the story even more. I had recently before that taken a 10-week course with a global, change, a global climate change scientist who had recently run the Nobel Prize for 10 weeks, 10 weeks with that guy, and I still didn't have a recycling. I had been hearing about global climate change for 10 years at that point in my liberal Southern California, and I didn't change. 10 days into a relationship with hot British girl? Environmentalist. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and so, um, so, well, what, so even after her, I started doing these things, and then I became and have been much more involved in environmentalism and now do a bunch of research on it. And, um, and so the lesson of this is, well, one side lesson is, for the younger people in the room, don't date somebody who just makes you want to change everything about yourself. Sometimes it can go okay, but you should date someone like my amazing partner, uh, Dr. Casey Wills over here, who helps edit and uh, put together some of the talks, um, and is an interdisciplinary humanities person and talks about my research in class, and on top of it is a bombshell California girl. 22-year-old Troy was like, oh, yeah, hot British girl. Well, he had no clue what was coming for him, right? <laughs> and so recently, she was teaching my research in her class, and she said something, and she explained it in a way, and I'm like, can I steal that? And she's like, well, you've already stolen so much from me. I'm like, what? <laughs> my heart, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Love is cheesy, and that's why it's good. Because um, cheese is awesome. Um, and so this is what, this is how she explains it. So she explains, especially coming from the humanities and doing interdisciplinary research with the science, is that we're taught in rhetorical argument these three Greek words. Communicate with logos, logic. Communicate with pathos, emotion. Communicate with ethos, moral appeals. But what I'm gonna talk about today a lot is that that isn't enough to convince people to change, because so much of what's going on is something that you might, if you want to make a word that sounds Greek, go with egos, or psychos, and the psychology. What Jen just talked about, what Craig will talk about in a bit. So today, what I want to do is uh, talk to you about these things, and I want to have a metaphor, and I really, I really believe this, and it's my goal is that I want to be the most influential social psychologist who isn't famous. Because really where I feel comfortable, and what I like doing, is that I am like Q, and we're going to spend some time with my lab, but do you know if I'm Q, what I think of you guys, right? You are James Bond. And so what I want to do is have you come in my lab, and I want to share some tools with you to help you fight your battles, because you guys truly do amazing things, right? Last night, having conversations about people, you know, writing things for the to the Supreme Court, or just having people argue with a relative over Thanksgiving dinner and not pointing it down about some bunk science. Now, that's very hard. I'm nervous about that and often let my little brother do it. He's a much better person than I am, and we'll get to that later. Um, and you do it with bravery. 
So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to have you come in, and I'm going to teach you a couple things. I'm going to teach you the two types of weapons that you would find in a lab, things that help you scan and notice things that you wouldn't notice, and then things that actually help you deal with those things, the, the weapons. And here's the thing. Because of who you are, because of your situation, because you're in different lanes, you, like James Bond, are going to walk into my lab and be like, no, no, that's cool, but that's not for my mission. Maybe that's for that other double agent, but not mine. And you might even say, actually, it doesn't really work like that out in the real world. Here's some thoughts, Q. Make me this, and I'll come back. Because that's what I really, really want to be. Because I do, and I stay so long in these labs, because I do it, because, and the only reason I do it is because all of you people read this wonderful research that comes out of my field of public interest, social psychology, and pro-social marketing, and unconscious bias research, and you take that and you improve the already amazing things you're doing, and I legitimately could not feel happier to be a part of that. All right. So, um, uh, I'm also going to put a huge deck of stuff on my website to explain these things uh, in short form that I'll go through even in short form. Just a little background on me. Uh, the reason I'm here is Elizabeth Loftus posted some pictures of her at a Halloween party last year. Yeah, and I was like, I got to come. Um, I worked with behavioral economists. I'm a professor, and I worked with lots and lots of companies. And uh, some people don't want to work with big companies. So many people in big companies want the world to change. And if you want the world to get better, and you can go into a company and make people act more scientific and more inclusive in those companies, you can do an absolutely wonderful thing. So we work on the unconscious bias training with uh, companies like Apple and uh, Nike, as well as other things. Um, all right. So let's get on. Oh, oh that's, that's me reminding you. Go to my website. So a longish time ago, when I was about 14 years old, I was sitting in the third floor an office in beautiful Southern California. It was a beautiful summer day, and I should be the happiest person in the world because in the distance is Disneyland, behind me is the beach, and below is my beloved Starbucks. But I'm not happy. I'm just staring out that window because, and it still makes me sad. I've been depressed all summer, and my doctor, Dr. Manuel Fernandez, is telling me that I'm hypoglycemic and that I am really, really at risk for long-term health issues. And it can explain what's wrong with me right now. And here's the thing. What I did as a silly 14-year-old is I immediately denied it. In my own microcosm of science denial, this was me denying an expert saying something to me. And here's the thing. I wasn't denying it because I was scared of being sick when I'm 31 years old. What does a 14-year-old think about that? I was denying it for a very, very stupid reason, because I knew exactly what the solution was going to be, and that was that a nerdy 14-year-old with almost nothing else going on in his life would have to give up his favorite thing, a caramel frappuccino. <laughs> and this sounds stupid, it sounds stupid, but I was engaging in something my colleague Aaron and Kay, I call a solution aversion, denying a problem simply because you don't like the solution. I didn't want to give up this frappuccino. It was an object that obviously I love. Oh my gosh, you're delicious. It also made me feel cool as a 14-year-old. I did not have a lot going on as a 14-year-old. I had this and Harry Potter books. And it was the only time that I really felt uh, cool and connected with other people. And I knew if I couldn't have frappuccinos, I'd have to go to parties like I'd seen other people and I had to do actually a long time ago when I had allergies when I was younger, is like show up to party with fake sweets and you were just cruelly treated. So this is actually really important to me. And so here's the thing. Here's my doctor. He's an amazing scientist. On one hand, he is an amazing scientist, right? He's the first person to diagnose me after a summer of depressive hell. It's late August and he finally is the first one who's figured out what's wrong with me. But here's the thing. He's got to figure out why I'm denying this. Because if, even if he's got all the science right, if he doesn't get through to me, it doesn't matter. I won't change. So on the other hand, he has to be a great, at least, lay psychologist and understand that. And I am a healthy and happy person today, and I just actually had a heart-to-heart -heart with Dr. Manuel Fernandez a couple weeks ago, because he was a great scientist, but he was a great psychologist and saved me from my depression and my Sickness. So, here we go. 
There's a lot of problems out there. Whoa. Those, no, no, don't. Those were good comedy bits. <laughs> like that techno song with Dawkins in it. Um, all right, so um, point is there's a lot of solutions out there. And we often think that people are denying the problem because they're uneducated, because they're anti-science, or because the problem itself is scary. And all of those are true some of the time. But in addition, we wanted to add that in cases like climate change, we've done research, the solution is part of the reason that people are denying it. Now, understanding the solution is the reason people deny it. It doesn't give you an immediate fix to scientific communication, but it does help you with the truth. So I just want to make that point clear is that we look at people, and what we often don't do is realize what the Frappuccino is on the forehead. What is that thing that no matter what information we, can, we put them, if we don't deal with this thing, this implication of fact, how are we going to get through to them? And if we don't realize the Frappuccino's there, they look anti-science, they look uneducated, they look scared of the problem, but there's something else that's going on, right? As Jen talked about, potentially social connection, fear, anxieties. So, we do this simple research, which says that most facts have certain implications to those facts, and that the reason people deny facts is often those implications. We call this implications management, and it's an incredibly important thing to do in scientific communication. And what we talk about is how you deal with that usually is that people don't like things because it makes them give up an object that they'd like, because it makes them feel bad about themselves, or it hurts in some social way. And what, I think all of you intuitively know this, and all of you intuitively do these things, and all of you love people who are really good at this, right? So, Richard Dawkins, amazing scientist, has also been an amazing, influential person because he has shown the beauty of science, right? The poetry of reality, and made science, made being rational more enjoyable, or at least showed people that it can be. And then people like Stephen Fry come in and make it fun. Yeah. Dawkins, your talks are fun too. Um, um, right, Adam. Adam is a big person on making us feel okay with being wrong. So the implication of the fact isn't that we're a dumb idiot. And here, right, we are making it wonderful to be together, right? You came here. And I just want to point that what you came here is in part a social selfless act where you are helping science. Because every single time that one of you sits and talks to the other about science, about something that that person is probably pressured by their community or some part of society to deny, and you provide social support for it and make them feel part of a community, you are doing an amazing, amazing thing. And thank you that absolutely all of you people are here doing that for each other. So when I was younger, I was always, because I'm super woke, pro-gay marriage. 12-year-old pro-gay marriage. Woke as hell. Now here's where I don't sound as good. So the reason that I said that I supported gay marriage, the argument that I gave was that as I was the musical Avenue Q, as they say, gay is okay because it's in your DNA, right? But here's the thing. Later, there was some science that came out, whether this science is good or not, I sort of believed it, that at least some of homosexuality, some of sexual behavior can be explained by situations and free choice. Now, here's the thing. Science changed, facts changed. Shouldn't my beliefs have changed? But did they? No. I didn't change my belief. I just changed why I said I had my belief. I said that gay marriage is something that's unfalsifiable. Love is love. Look at my cool t-shirt. And this is something we see all around, people bouncing between science and morality. Here's um, the numbers Republican explaining, even if the government was good at picking winners and losers, they shouldn't be in the business of picking winners and losers because that's not the principle of government. In other words, even if the fact's wrong, I'm still right on principle. And of course, Religion. Have I offended everyone? Cool. Good. Good. Everyone? Everyone feels included in the being offended? So we call this flight from facts, and we think it is an important, important nuance in scientific communication, is that people don't just deny facts when they are protecting their beliefs. They often remove the relevance of facts from their beliefs. 
Um, so this was actually on an episode of Adam Ruins Everything, where Adam, who's like, wonderful, I've convinced people of the facts, now they'll update their associated belief systems, right? And Emily's like, nah, 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 I read some research by Troy Campbell, I'm gonna punch you in the face with it. And so, in, in what she calls, when a fact contradicts our belief, we often hide behind emotional arguments that cannot be disproven. Um, and of course, since Adam was here last night, we had to replicate that. <laughs> yep. Also, uh, my lady said, God damn, is he photogenic. Like, even in, even in that. Um, so we did some research, and when we show people facts that support or not support some system, they move around whether they say that things should be based on opinions and morals and facts. Maybe one of the most enlightening examples of this is just one we did on browsers a, a while ago as part of a marketing study. So people report what browser they use, and then they, in the control condition, they, um, they, when we don't tell them any bit, more or less everybody's saying speed is the reason that they're using their browser. Something's cutting us off. But the point is that if they were to say speed is their top rating, it would be all the way at the top. But then what we did with another group of participants is we said, hey, tell us what you're, you know, why you use your browser. Is it speed? Is it safety? Is it all these other things? But just so you know, we're going to give you, at the end of the study, we're going to give you CNET.com's ranking of the fastest browsers so you can know which browsers are actually the fastest. And all of a sudden, speed is much, much less the reason that they say for their beliefs. So what's happened right here? People have changed the logical structure of their belief system so that they are less accountable to the facts. Right? And so we think, and it's, it's, it's true sometimes, we think that if we can just, yes, it's hard, but if we could just jam the facts, if we could get them to believe the facts, it'll accomplish everything but facts don't always compel. And so one model of motivated reasoning that the solution aversion stuff really works with is that people believe, bring facts in line with beliefs. But another model is the unfalsifiability. Out damn facts. Get away. That was the wrong cue. And they can be a happy little hedgehog. Right? Deleting the uh, implication structure. So, the lessons is that facts will not always compel, that facts are not the reason. So let me tell you a very similar story to the girlfriend story, which is um, my brother. So uh, anybody like me have the tragedy of being raised with a little brother or little sister who is just way better than them? Put your hands up. Put your hands in there. So sometimes when I have long times, people share, and it's just tragedy in these things, right? So I grew up with my little far taller brother. And if you want to, just picture in your head a tall, you know, really blonde surfer dude, you know, real broad shoulders. You got that image? Now, don't change anything. That's him. And then there was nerdy old me reading Harry Potter books. He was so cool. Everybody loved him. All my friends liked him more. Uh, he was rated, he won, not rated, he won third place in the entire Orange County in a stand-up competition. Four million people in this county. He's the third funniest. And he's the person I'm sitting at the dinner table with. He was so attractive that, another ex-girlfriend story, Academic All-American Casey, Casey Campbell comes up and plays lacrosse with his older brother, Troy Campbell. Casey's still in high school. Troy's in college. Troy's dating a girl. And the girl turns to me after playing lacrosse and says, Troy, it must be really hard to have grown up with a brother who's so much more attractive than you. <laughs> that, that relationship ended quickly. Still hurts. So here's the thing. Why am I telling this story? I'm telling this story because I always thought that I had one thing on my brother, that maybe I was a little bit better of a person. And I didn't dislike my brother. My brother's my favorite person. My brother's best man level person. I love this guy. He is cool. Everybody loves this guy. I love him a lot. And here's the thing. The story is about how I became an organ donor. When I became a driver, when I got my driver's license, I didn't get the organ donor sticker on it. I'm like, yeah, I'm a good person, but I didn't see like this is the thing that I really needed to do. And so I just didn't do it. And then my brother gets his driver's license. 
he comes home and he's like, Mom, I got my driver's license. And my mom is like, come over here, my favorite son, and show me a picture. She doesn't say favorite son, but we know. <laughs> she comes over and, and she shows it to my brother. My brother shows it to her and she's like, oh, it's so great that both of my sons are organ donors. And little Troy in the back is like, yeah, both of your sons. I'm going to go to the DMV. And I did, and I became an organ donor. And I became an organ donor not because it's the right thing to do. I really think it's the right thing to do now. I became an organ donor because I wanted to be better, or at least as good, as my bigger little brother. Right? So all these facts could have compelled me, but they don't. And it's a very, very, very sad truth, but people follow their crowd. Um, let's skip this section on lies. Point is, lies are signals of team signals. Whenever you accuse people of lying, sometimes that actually gives them greater standing with their group because that is a stronger signal. Um, but I spent too long on these stories, so here we go. Uh, so solution aversion, flight from facts, lies are signals. All right, is there any hope? Of course there's hope. A lot of you are showing that. And we have a lot of research on this idea. And I want to go one hard story on this really quick and then end with something. All right. This is a hard one. And I'm going to use a term that maybe I shouldn't use, but I feel like I'm the same, I am the same ethnicity as the person, so I'm going to use it. So there's a poor white man. He needs rule. Feels like white trash. He's been called white trash his whole life. And he thinks prejudice is, prejudice is wrong, and he thinks some of that stuff might be a little bullshit, but he's sitting there, and he's starving out in the cold of a winter, and he literally just went outside to shoot a squirrel so he could eat dinner. And he turns on the TV, and he turns on CNN, and the entire day, all he sees is nothing nothing about the issues that he deals with. He sees some students at Brown University in anthropology clothing complaining about microaggressions. He sees people talking about environmentalism. He can't even feed himself. And here's the thing. You should and, you should and can care about both of these things and all these things at once, but our news often focuses only on certain issues. And as the great Psychologist Mark O'Leary says, being ignored is the same thing as being hated. And in how we think about how we go with our communication of our things, we are criticizing, we are communicating without care. And if we are sort of treating people like the enemy, or at least treating them not like a friend, and we are often turning them into the enemy. So we have a line of research which we call Start With Care. And the simple principle is, if you are ever trying to convince anybody of anything, show that you care for some of their concerns first. Because if you are ever going to get somebody to care about your concerns, you have to show that you care about their concerns, especially when your concern is going to be a criticism of them, which is to some degree what most all of us are doing to criticize. So. In an ideal world, there wouldn't be a marketing professor at a conference about science, right? In an ideal world, frappuccinos wouldn't get in, the f in, in front of science. But we don't live in an ideal world, we live in this world. And in this very unide unideal world, we're gonna need some unideal solutions. And this stuff is crazy, this stuff is this stuff is really complicated. You know, as we say in inclusion training and when we do it with different groups, sometimes you need to shut down a freeway and sometimes you need to hug a racist. It's confusing. And you know what? I'm angry all the time too, right? I'm the nice psychologist saying welcome change, understand conservatives, understand other people. But I definitely believe there is a time for the middle finger, right? There's a time to say, screw you, get up, you're wrong, stand up, you're bad, F you, right? There's a time for this. But as you know what I'm going to say next, is there's a time, and we all know this, to put this away. 
And here's the problem. Understanding when that time is hard, but there's another thing. Understanding when we actually still have that out, when we don't realize we have it out, is really problematic. We're saying F you to a person, but not realizing that their entire following sometimes can be accused and along with that, right? So when Jen takes on Gwen, she is really great at showing that she cares for women, right? So women and the people following her know that she's on their side. You want that guy out of office? There is a sort of a solution and it's two prong. You convince people that the people who support him, he doesn't support. And that you yourself support them because they feel uncared for. And a lot of them voted for Obama four years ago, five years ago. Team science is fighting a very interesting battle. Right? It's a very interesting battle. Because the way that team science wins is when we get everyone, or at least a lot more people, Division should look like this, and scientific communication should look like this, as we welcome people into it. People who have denied science because they just didn't want to have something, they didn't want to give up their frappuccino, or Adam giving up his drink, which he said last night, who taken a fight from facts. Those are the people that we eventually want, at least a lot of them, on our team. So keep your middle finger ready, but also have your hands open when you need to. I can't tell you when that is, that's not my job, but I hope that as your cue on your missions as you awesome James Bonds, you can think of a couple more tools that can help you with that. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and ring that bell to be notified about new videos. You can follow us on social media, and if you really love what we do, consider supporting us with a donation. Links to all that good stuff is in the description below.